Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Lauren. I am Ken. And you may recognize our voices from the podcast, Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. But today we're here to tell you about a nonprofit organization we have created called the Florida Themis Project. Themis is the Greek goddess of justice, in case you're wondering about the name. The Florida Themis Project aims to support loved ones and victims of unsolved crimes by financially contributing to various types of investigative tools, including DNA testing. We also help families and loved ones of missing people by assisting with awareness campaigns, uh, helping with ground searches, or any other assistance that we can provide to the families. So we are asking for your help to spread the word and grow our organization so we can help as many people as possible. Please be sure to check out our website at floridathemasproject.org for info about how you can help us or donate. We are also on Facebook and Instagram at Florida Themis Project. Even something simply as sharing our post on social media is very helpful. For the month of September, we are doing a public awareness campaign for the missing Jennifer Kessie out of Orlando, Florida. You can hear our podcast episode about the case and read more on the blog on our website. Again, that's floridathemasproject.org. That's F-L-O-R-I-D-A-T-H-E-M-I-S project.org. And if you're planning on being at CrimeCon in Orlando this year, stop by the Paradise After Dark podcast table on Podcast Row and say hello. We'd love to tell you more. Thanks in advance, true crime friends, for your help and support. Today marks 17 years since the disappearance of Jennifer Kessie. On January 24th in 2006, the then 24-year-old vanished in Orlando. And to this day, no one has been arrested in the case. 10 Tampa Bay's Megan Myers has a closer look at the ongoing mystery. Every single second of every single day to us is frantic because we need to find her. That's Jennifer's dad, Drew Kessie, from an interview in 2019. Years later, that feeling lingers. Telling me just hours ago, today is a very difficult day. The Florida Department of Law Enforcement has now taken over the high-profile case. The Kessie family's own team of investigators is also continuing to search for leads. This comes after the Kessie family says Jennifer's case was improperly investigated by Orlando police. Shortly after Jennifer's disappearance, officers found her car abandoned, releasing blurry surveillance video of a person they wanted to question. 17 years later, that video hasn't led to any answers for the family. We cannot see that person's face ever in anything that we have. Her parents say it's their hope to find Jennifer in their lifetime. Megan Myers, 10 Tampa Bay. The Orlando Police Department, the original agency handling the case, will now have no involvement. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Lauren. And I am Ken. And this is Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. Paradise After Dark is a Palmahawk Media production covering true crime, unsolved mysteries, missing people, urban legends, and strange places. And make sure you go to our website, paradiseafterdark.com. On the website, you'll find links to all of our episodes, even the archived ones, our mailing list, merch store, links to our social medias, and our Patreon. We also have a cute, cool little tip jar there, so if you want to swing by and throw a couple coins in, we'll give you a shout out at the show. Now, this episode is being created in conjunction with our new nonprofit organization, the Florida Themis Project. The Themis Project is highlighting and creating an awareness campaign for Jennifer Kessie this month. If you'd like to help support the Florida Themis Project, please check out our website at floridathemisproject.org. Link will be in the show notes. And we are also on all the social medias. So, Lauren, there's also a little bit of news because September... CrimeCon is finally here, and starting September 22nd to the 24th, Paradise After Dark, Lauren and I will be at CrimeCon in Orlando, the World Marriott. Yes, that's right, and you still have time to get a ticket. Go to CrimeCon.com, use code PARADISE for 10% off. Yeah, we'd love to see you there. So, Lauren, you said that uh, we are working in conjunction with Themis for the case of Jennifer Kessie. Yes, we are covering the case of Jennifer Kessie out of Orlando, Florida. Jennifer Kessie grew up near Tampa, Florida. Described by her parents in the Investigation Discovery Show Disappeared as an enchanting child who always had a thirst for learning and was extremely inquisitive. She was highly intelligent and attended the University of Central Florida in Orlando where she thrived. 
She was in a sorority. She got great grades. She graduated in 2003 with a degree in finance. After college, she was immediately hired as a financial analyst for Westgate Resorts and was promoted three times in the first year. Now, at age 23, she bought herself her own condo. It's pretty impressive at 23. And the condo was in this up-and-coming area of Orlando. Actually, it was somewhat of a not-so-great area that the city was actually trying to improve on. There was a lot of construction going on in this particular area, and the Mall of Millennia had just been built right across the street from Jennifer's new condo. And the condo complex was called Mosaic at the Millennia. It was originally one of those apartment complexes, and at the time, they were transforming several apartment complexes to condos, and they actually made these available for sale. So there was always constant construction being performed. So it was workers around, a lot of noise. She was also in constant contact with her family, always calling to check in with them. Before Jennifer and her brother were born, their parents, Drew and Joyce Kessie, had been robbed at gunpoint once before. This sort of directed how they raised their children in regards to awareness, because safety was always a big topic in the Kessie household, and the kids were taught safety procedures at a young age. In January of 2006, 24-year-old Jennifer was dating a man named Rob Allen. It had recently become a long-distance relationship, with Rob moving to Fort Lauderdale, about four hours away from Orlando. They tried to spend as many weekends together as possible. They had been together for about a year when they took a trip to St. Croix together. During this trip, Jennifer called her dad three times in four days while she was on the trip. When they returned on Sunday, January 22nd of 2006, Jennifer stayed the night at Rob's house, then left early the next morning and went straight to work. She called her younger brother, Logan, as she made her way back to Orlando from Fort Lauderdale that morning. She was at work all day and left that evening around 6 p.m. After work, she was exhausted and happy to be home in her own place. She did, however, speak to her aunt and her best friend on the phone that evening, her nightly call to her boyfriend at 9.57 p.m. The next morning, Jennifer failed to show up at her work. When Jennifer missed an 11 o'clock meeting, so a very important meeting that she missed, her boss actually called her parents, who he personally knew, and asked if they knew where she was. Jennifer's father tried to call her and it went directly to voicemail. In the same ID show that Lauren mentioned earlier, Drew spoke of the unwritten rule in their family. If mom or dad calls, no matter if you're 16 or 24, you pick up the phone. And Drew explained that at that moment, he knew something was very wrong. Jennifer's family contacted Rob, her boyfriend, and he hadn't heard from her and also mentioned that it was strange because just like their nightly calls, she usually called him each morning before work and he hadn't heard from her that morning. He tried to call her, but it went straight to voicemail. Knowing that something was definitely wrong, Jennifer's parents and brother hopped in the car and made the trip from Tampa to Orlando an approximately 90-minute drive. On the drive, Drew called the manager of the condos where Jennifer lived and asked him to check if her car was there. The manager reported back that it wasn't. When they arrived, they noticed that her car was missing but saw nothing out of the ordinary in her home. Her suitcase was still unpacked. A wet towel and clothes laid out, among other things, suggesting that she had showered, dressed, and prepared for work that morning. The only thing that appeared to be missing, aside from Jennifer herself, was her purse, keys, and cell phone. A canister of mace, which she usually carried for self-protection, was found on the kitchen counter. So the family immediately called the Orlando police. But like most of these cases where an adult goes missing, the police didn't take it very seriously. Now, in their defense, Jennifer did live alone, was 24, and could have very well decided to just go somewhere or not go anywhere at all. But the Cassies knew better. Just like most family members, you know, you, you know your children better. Yeah, you, you know. Now, Jennifer's family and friends immediately had flyers printed with her picture and began distributing them at rush hour on that same exact day. Now, they stood at the intersections that Jennifer would have passed on her way to and from work in hopes that someone would have noticed her or anything out of the ordinary 
but just anything that could help them. Meanwhile, the family learned some details about the condo complex that Jennifer was living in. It was newer, and only half the condos were occupied. There was no security cameras. There were construction workers working throughout the complex at the time of Jennifer's disappearance, and the gates at the front, this was supposed to be a gated community, but they were left open to allow construction crews in and out. Soon the media picked up the story, and only then were detectives from the Orlando PD assigned to the case, and Jennifer's finally entered into the system as a missing person. By Wednesday, January 25th, Jennifer's photo and description of her car were in the local papers and on the news. By Thursday morning, Jennifer's car had been found. A woman called in saying that she believed that the car was in the parking lot of where she lives. In fact, it was. It was found parked at the Huntington on the Green apartment complex about a mile away from her condo. Now, Huntington on the Greens, where her car was found, was known for high drug activity, and law enforcement did mention that they have found abandoned stolen cars left there before. Now, detectives opened the trunk, half expecting to find Jennifer in there, but the trunk was empty. Another odd fact that I found out looking into this is they had Rob, her boyfriend, there at the scene to watch his reaction as they opened the trunk because he entered in as a suspect right away. As we all know, it's always the husband. Yes. Yeah, I actually did know that. They actually waited for him to get there to open the trunk just because they wanted to see what his reaction would be. So obviously, as we know now, she was not there. Now, the front seat in her vehicle had been moved back as if a taller person than Jennifer was driving. There were valuables still in the car that hadn't been taken. Now, obviously, Lauren, this is going to rule out that there was a carjacking or robbery or anything like that because obviously the valuables were left. So it, it kind of just believed. It kind of led detectives to believe that someone just dumped the car there. So this is a car dump. Yeah. Well, there were cameras at this apartment complex. Their surveillance footage shows an unidentified person of interest dropping Jennifer's vehicle off at approximately noon on the day she went missing. No one who knew Jennifer recognized the person in the video, but the video is very grainy And the person was walking behind a fence and it almost just perfectly, the fence blocked this person's face and their features where in the video you do not get a look at this person's face and you can't even tell if it's a male or a female. What they did get from the video was that this person was wearing a uniform type outfit, khaki pants and a white t-shirt. The landscapers that were working in Jennifer's complex wore similar uniforms. The FBI was called in to help determine the person's size and gender, but could only say that the person stood between five foot three and five foot five. NASA even enhanced the video to help identify the suspect, but they got no further. Okay, so as we mentioned, the car had been found, so they found this video, so they're getting some description of the driver. Now, what they do know is that it took the driver 32 seconds to actually get out of Jennifer's car, which means he was probably most likely wiping it down and, or clearing any possible evidence that may have been left in the car. And like Lauren mentioned, I think we need to discuss further that the video footage um, actually just points out how lucky this person the video had gotten. I mean, the cameras, you know, like Laura mentioned, they were, they were not streaming. And what we're trying to say is they, they took a still shot every three to four seconds and that sort of created the video. So it was like a, almost like a little strobe light, just click, yeah. click, click. And the person, in the video just managed, he was, it doesn't look like he was trying to, if you watch the video, which you can actually watch at uh, jenniferkessie.com. The family has a website and this video is on there and it's easy to find if you go there. You can see the person walk and it's like as it takes a picture, there's a like a, a larger post and then you have the little rungs of the fence. His face is perfectly hidden and it just got really extremely lucky in the yeah. situation that his face was not visible to where even when they had NASA enhanced the video, they could get no features. Um, it was just a really lucky situation, unfortunately, for Jennifer, but very lucky for the individual. 
So now that the Orlando police finds the car, they bring in a scent dog who tracked a scent from Jennifer's car back to her own complex. Now, the police canine went from where her car was found to the condo complex where she lived. I mean, literally right to her building. So it's pretty safe to say that the person that dropped off the car walked back to the Mosaic condos. Because how could the dog possibly know where Jennifer lived? They started this search at the car. Right, yeah. So this would also lead me to believe that the person in the video lived or worked at the complex. Right. So they dropped the car off. So they're going to go back to the complex. Did they return back to the complex to get their own vehicle? Were they going home, back to work? Now, one person that was looked at very closely was Jennifer's ex-boyfriend. Now, he was apparently extremely upset when they broke up and didn't want to let things go, which I think everybody's had a relationship like that yeah. at one point or another. Now, when it was discovered that he was actually drinking at a bar called the Blue Martini across the street from Jennifer's condo the night she disappeared, he quickly became a suspect. But there was never any evidence actually linking him to Jennifer on the morning of her disappearance. Now, what makes him odd is that he lived roughly 30 minutes away but happened to be at the bar across the street. So there's some things you got to take into consideration. I mean, maybe he was at Jennifer's condo that weekend hanging out with Logan, her brother, because I believe I read where Matt and her brother sort of remained friends and they had other friends that they hung out with. And we know that Logan was actually at the apartment while Jennifer was gone because Logan had said that one of his friends, he actually mentioned this to Jennifer directly, that one of his friends, I believe it was Tony, had left his phone there and it asked Jennifer to FedEx it back to him, which she was going to do. Not a tragedy like it would be now to not have your phone because it's just cell phones. You go back yeah. then. It, it was literally just pretty much a phone. Now, her ex-boyfriend, whose name is Matt, he did agree to a polygraph. But Orlando Police Department never performed one. Really? They never performed it. So I guess they figured they had everything they need to clear him. If you want to use the word clear, I think if somebody's missing – Nobody's cleared. Everyone's a suspect. Right. Well, police looked at the construction workers that were working in the complex. Some of them admitted that they had been living in some of the empty units. Jennifer had previously told her boyfriend and her father that the workers made her uncomfortable because they would stare at her when she's coming in and out, going to and from her car. Now, as soon as detectives started asking questions, the construction workers scattered. Well, it turns out they were all pretty much undocumented workers. So, of course, they would not really want to talk to police. But again, there was no evidence to link any of the construction workers to Jennifer. Another theory landed on one of Jennifer's co-workers. This man was married, but apparently, according to witnesses, he was obsessed with Jennifer he would ask her out constantly, and it made her uncomfortable to the point where she called her dad for advice on how to handle him. The day Jennifer went missing, he was actually late for work. He apparently said at one point after Jennifer went missing, well, she's probably been eaten by gators by now. But it turned out that he was late for work that day because he had gotten a speeding ticket and got mouthy with the officer and was arrested. So that's pretty solid alibi that you were, you know, in jail. Well, in this situation, it's probably best that that occurred because otherwise he could have really been heavily, heavily looked into. Heavily scrutinized. Yeah, because. That scrutinized. That's a good word. I like that better than my word. Okay. So now more tips obviously came in over the next weeks, months, but nothing comes of anything. So they're getting all these tips coming. I think they had over a thousand call in tips, things that came in and nothing. Yeah. So obviously this sort of deflates, you know, the spirits of the police department, the family, everything. So now we get to May of 2007. Now the company Jennifer worked for, led by a man named David A. Siegel, offered a $1 million reward for information leading to her whereabouts with a July 4th deadline and the stipulation that she had to be alive. Now, obviously, as we know, recording this, this reward was never claimed. On May 2nd, 2008, the Florida House of Representatives unanimously passed Senate Bill 502, the Jennifer Kessie and Tiffany Sessions Missing Person Act, to reform how missing person cases are handled in Florida. Now, Jennifer's photo was added to a deck of playing cards that feature missing people and unsolved homicide. 
These decks are usually given out in jails and prison. In December of 2008, detectives got a call that a convicted killer, David Russ, who was on death row, had information about Jennifer's case. He will only speak to Jennifer's father, Drew, face to face. Well, Drew agrees to the meeting, but it turns out that David Russ was lying, trying to pin the murder on another inmate. Drew and his family were devastated. Well, obviously, because this man was confident, got him to come in and sort of led them in. And I, I think it was that's, that's a horrific thing to do I for know. a grieving family. It is. Um, but unfortunately, this is what you run into when you have inmates trying to either cut a deal or basically rat somebody else out. Yeah. Well, on the ID show disappeared, Jennifer's father, Drew, stated that he believed Jennifer had been trafficked. As everyone knows, Orlando has a massive tourism draw that brings several thousands of people in and out of the city daily. Yes. It's huge. I mean, you know, Disney, you've got Universal Studios. I mean, there's so many things going on in Orlando, so therefore it's a heavy draw, a lot of population. Now, at the time of her disappearance, there actually was a major human trafficking ring that was taken down in the Orlando area. Not surprising. No. And again, it's a great place. If that's the job you're in is trafficking humans, it's a great place to find them. Right. Because they're all unaware. It's an unfamiliar city. They're on vacation. So their inhibitions are sort of loose. They're having drinks. They're out and about. Now, investigators have stated that they cannot rule this theory out of Jennifer being abducted to be trafficked outside of Florida or the country, rather, because she fits like a certain profile that is common among trafficking. It's that she's a beautiful girl. She's got long blonde hair, the blue eye. I mean, it's the the, yeah. the ideal person that gets trafficked. Now, it would be easy for the workers at her complex to learn her routine. I mean, they would even know when she leaves her work, what car she drives. It's possible they could have even had people put in place if, in fact, there was more than one person involved to abduct her. Because, again, they know her routine and what she's going to do. Now, although she may have felt uncomfortable, see, she with these workers around, she could have felt uncomfortable because the workers, you know, they like Lauren mentioned earlier, they were always catcalling her and the way they acted toward her. But she sees them there every day, which would make this less likely that she would have suspected anything. I mean, if she recognized somebody that was there all the time or these people were there all the time, she would have just assumed that they're just there working. Right. Yeah, that not, makes sense. And she's going to the car. She, yeah, she might feel uncomfortable because it's an awkward situation because of the way she's been treated by the said workers. Maybe not the ones involved. Maybe. But, I mean, do you agree that it's possible that they would just, she would have just gone right to her car and they yeah. could have done what they wanted because she would have never suspected them? Right. By June of 2010, the FBI had taken the case over from the Orlando Police Department. A $5,000 reward for information leading to the whereabouts of Jennifer's remains was available through the Central Florida crime line. After years of no answers, in late 2017 and early 2018, Jennifer's family began asking the police to hand over the documents in the case. Drew Cassie told Fox News that the Orlando Police Department had largely denied the family access to information in this case. He had hired a team of lawyers and investigators in hopes that they could find answers where others haven't, and was considering legal action. Drew said the family had little access to the case outside of a two-page document, which was heavily redacted. That was a slap in the face to us, he said. Around the same time, Chief John Mina announced in a press conference the department is assigning a detective to the case full-time. They also announced that they would be rolling out a city bus with Jennifer's picture on it and placing similar billboards around the city. Jennifer's family, in particular her brother, called out the department after the press conference saying they haven't done enough. It's pretty common sense that everybody can read between the lines of this dog and pony show, Logan Kessie told 10 News. Logan also accused the department of only stepping up because the family had gotten attorneys involved. Well, in December of 2018, the family actually filed a lawsuit against the city of Orlando Police Department and the department's chief. In the suit, the family was seeking the release of thousands of pages of documents pertaining to the case. So they want to basically take over this case and eliminate law enforcement. Well, eliminate the Orlando PD. Yes. They were not getting along at this point. 
Yeah, that is true. Because, of course, they felt like they should be doing more. And obviously, that's always how you're going to feel if there's no result. Right. In an email exchange with the Kessie's attorney, an assistant attorney for the city of Orlando provides an estimate for the documents the attorneys requested in 2017. It would cost over $18,000 to review the approximately 14,600 pages of case files, which the lawsuit alleges, quote, would likely result in the production of nothing but a pile of mostly blacked out records, unquote. The Kessie's attorney announced that the proposed amount cited by the Orlando Police Department is exorbitant and unreasonable and used solely as an unlawful restriction to deter the Kessies from further pursuing the records. It basically priced them out of the market. Right, yeah. So in March of 2019, the family finally received the unredacted report on Jennifer's disappearance. They actually did pay the $18,648.24 for these documents. The family released a statement. Now, this is in March of 2019. After 13 years since Jennifer was abducted and over two years of pressing the Orlando Police Department and the city of Orlando to allow us, Jennifer Kessie's family, full access to her case through legal channels. We have come to an agreement with the city and the department whereby we will finally receive a copy of Jennifer's full police files, unredacted, as we have been fighting for for so long. It is an absolutely huge step forward in our fight for Jennifer. One challenge has been in getting access to the files, the ultimate goal of finding Jennifer still remains, and it will be a daunting task after 13 years gone. Now, unfortunately, they did not actually get these files. Okay, and we're back. January of 2022 marked 16 years since Jennifer's disappearance. In the message on their GoFundMe page at this time, Drew Kessie accused the Orlando Police Department of negligence and said it was incapable of fulfilling an agreement to provide the family with a digital file of Jennifer's case. Here's where we are. Almost four years ago, we came to an agreement with the Orlando Police Department that they would, over a period of four months, generate a digital file of Jennifer's case and give it to us at their requested cost of over $18,000. We paid the price in full up front, Kessie said. So in 2019, they agreed and the Kessies paid. And here we are in 2022 and the Kessies still have not received these documents after they paid over $18,000 almost four years ago. Instead of an easy transaction, Kessie said the family has spent the last several years fighting against the machine that is Orlando politics. Now imagine over that time fighting for unredacted copies with the city's lawyers and trying to have our private investigators find Jennifer from all those files, then finding out that the lead detective on Jennifer's case did not write a single report or document since 2010, 12 years, wow. Kessie said. We firmly believe the department's negligence and lack of competency cost Jennifer the chance to be found. Well, the Orlando Police Department issued the following statement to News 6. The Orlando Police Department remains committed to finding the answers to the disappearance of Jennifer Kessie. Despite our 16-year commitment, there are some cases that remain difficult to solve. Since our agreement to produce the documents in this matter, we have worked closely with their counsel and have turned over thousands of pages of documents and hours of recordings for their independent team to review and investigate. Our hearts continue to go out to the entire Cassie family, and our detectives will continue to investigate any new leads. Yes, and that was back in 2020. They released that statement. But in January of this year, a renewed sense of hope was felt by all when the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, or FDLE for short, took over the case. I think right now we are in the best position in 17 years because the FDLE wants the case. They know what they're doing. It's a cold case division specifically looking at the case, Drew Kessie told the U.S. Sun in January. It's positive in that respect. We have met the new detective and are able to move forward. We have had things to do with the case needing to be worked on for about a year now. 
It's just been about getting it to the right people who have the ability, knowledge, desire, and experience to do it right. Over the past 17 years, we have spent over $700,000, but we can't look at that. People have been very generous with the GoFundMe pages and help us continue what we are trying to do. And Drew added, we just weren't willing to let Orlando deal with Jennifer anymore, so we were able to have a meeting with the powers that be in the state, as well as law enforcement and the police department, and everybody thought it would be best if the FDLE became involved. They've now received everything and we are moving forward, although the sad part is that we have discovered that over the last 10 to 12 years, No investigators have looked at Jennifer's case. We are with a good crew at state level now, and I have known them for many, many years. I have been requesting it for many years. And finally, we are in the right hands. Now, the U.S. Sun reached out to the Orlando Police Department for comment, but got no response. And while Drew doubts his daughter is still alive, he said, we just aren't willing to say, oh, well, and leave it. So anyone with information into Jennifer Kessie's disappearance can call the Kessie family tip line at area code 941-201-4009 or the crime line at 1-800-423-TIPS. That's 1-800-423-8477. I'm going to highly encourage everyone to go to jenniferkessie.com This is a website that is, I believe, put together by the family to put some information out there. And I think it's important that if you really are interested in this case, uh, what you should be, go there. You'll be able to see the videos. They have all the links to all of the, the shows, the ID show, 48 hours, all the things on the case. So it's really a very intuitive website. So you can be more involved in this case. I think it's a, it's, it's one of those crazy cases. That I think was it was either seriously planned or random, which is pretty much how they all are. Yeah. And it's hard when you can't even pinpoint that down. Exactly. So I highly encourage that. And I'm 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 very excited. This is a great episode for Themis to sort of back and push because obviously everyone needs everyone needs to come home. And I think it's best we get Jennifer Kessie to come back. So I guess uh, is there anything else you want to add tonight, Lauren? Nope, that's it. All right. I guess that's going to be it. All right. To learn more about the Florida Themis Project, please visit floridathemisproject.org. And you can also check out our website at paradiseafterdark.com. Yeah, on the website, there's links to all of our social medias, our Patreon, merch store, and more. Please make sure to subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening and rate and review us. This really, really helps us branch out and reach a wider audience. I'm excited to hopefully meet some of y'all at CrimeCon. And thank you, everyone, for listening to Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. recognize our voices from the podcast Paradise After Dark. Dark, 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 dark. But today we're here to tell you about a nonprofit organization we have created called the Florida Themis Project. Themis is the Greek goddess of justice, in case you're wondering about the name. The Florida Themis Project aims to support loved ones and victims of unsolved crimes by financially contributing to various types of investigative tools, including DNA testing. We also help families and loved ones of missing people by assisting with awareness campaigns, uh, helping with ground searches, or any other assistance that we can provide to the families. So we are asking for your help to spread the word and grow our organization so we can help as many people as possible. Please be sure to check out our website at floridathemisproject.org for info about how you can help us or donate. We are also on Facebook and Instagram at Florida Themis Project. Even something simply as sharing our posts on social media is very helpful. For the month of September, we are doing a public awareness campaign for the missing Jennifer Kessie out of Orlando, Florida. You can hear our podcast episode about the case and read more on the blog on our website. 
Again, that's FloridaThemasProject.org. That's F-L-O-R-I-D-A-T-H-E-M-I-S Project.org. And if you're planning on being at CrimeCon in Orlando this year, stop by the Paradise After Dark podcast table on Podcast Row and say hello. We'd love to tell you more. Thanks in advance, true crime friends, for your help and support.